so we don't have to go to physical. And we'll start here in line. That already did. Okay, good, good. Hello everybody, I'm Scott Stengel from Melco Applications, here to share a couple of tips on digitizing for foam. Uh, last week Sue gave us a demo on how to sew foam on hats with a lot of the rules, and today uh, I'd like to share a little bit of uh, the mechanics of how uh, foam digitizing works. So first, um, the most common question I think we get here, and I will switch over. Um, <clears throat> is why can't I just uh, take alphabet text, throw the foam in there, add density, and uh, expect uh, magic to happen? Well, the reason for that is regular embroidery and puff embroidery um, differ in um, several areas. First of all, we have what are called open ends right here with normal embroidery text. It's not a problem because it sits right on the fabric. It is a problem with the foam because we need the needle penetrations to help cut the foam um, so we can pull it away, and there are no needle penetrations at the end. Remember, satin stitches only penetrate at the outside edges, never in the middle. So we kind of get a tug of war going on with the ends because there's nothing to help sever it. Um, the other big uh, concern with puff embroidery digitizing is where seams happen. So right here we have a 90 degree seam. Here's another one. We have them at all the serifs where they meet the um, uh, vertical legs. So we have to um, make sure that that is taken care of or the foam will stick out through there and look terrible. So um, <clears throat> first of all, let's start out with a few uh, general rules. Sue went over some of these um, last week, but I want to cover them for those that weren't uh, available to attend it, and it's always good to reinforce the concepts. So first of all, of course, puff is a very stitch-intensive uh, application. So it's not going to be suited for lightweight fabrics like piquet or performance wear or silk or something like that. Very stable. Most common use, as we all know, is going to be for um, caps, baseball hats. Um, you could put it on other stable garments, such as uh, backpacks, um, maybe thick coats, things like that. But you want to have some body to the uh, to the fabric so that you don't get puckering and uh, you know, kind of a silly look. It wouldn't be a good idea to put on a t-shirt, again, so to speak. Hey, Scott. Uh, go back to Facebook real quick. Oh, am I not? Um... I don't know. Some people, I'm seeing it. A lot of people are saying they aren't. Just do me a favor. It says preview. Yeah, do manual me a favor start. and hit manual start and hit OK. Content's not available. Great. Hit close. Okay. Scheduling the broadcast. Please try again. Hit OK. And hit go live. There we go. Hopefully that'll work. I'm, I, I was seeing it. Um, a lot of people weren't. So hopefully this is going to help out a lot of people. Um, so you may just do a quick refresher of what okay. we're talking about. Sorry. <laughs> In review. <laughs> <laughs> and sorry. Uh, okay. So, uh, yeah, let me know if people still can't there, see there, them all. Every, There's a lot of people saying enough. they are. Only a few people were saying they weren't. Hopefully this helps get to everybody. Good. But now they, they hopefully are good. Okay, so uh, very common people say, um, why can't I just use alphabet text, throw the foam in, increase the density, and have great results? The reason is uh, the foam adds a certain different dimension to the digitizing. And in regular embroidery, uh, lettering is usually satin stitches. Remember, satin stitches only penetrate on the outside edges, never in the middle. We rely on the, the needle penetrations to cut the foam, and so we have nothing on the ends to uh, perforate the foam, so we get a nice tug of war, which is not going to be good. Um, so that's one thing is we have to take care of the open ends. In this case, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of them right here, plus all the seams where the stitches intersect uh, at angles, 90 degrees in this case. So uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, just in this letter alone. Um, so uh, some extra concerns that we have to take to when digitizing for puff. Um, it really is different enough that you can't just take a regular logo um, 
you know, sometimes close the ends at density and get it to work. We have to take care of multiple areas within the characters to make sure that they're secured and uh, things behave properly. So, a couple of rules. Sue mentioned some of these um, in the sewing puff um, demo that she did, and I'll just go over them real quick. So, stable garments. We're going to need coarse baseball hats work very well. Um, you could do bags, maybe backpacks, thicker coats, um, some, some material that has a body to it. It wouldn't be a good application for performance wear or t-shirts or piquet shirts or stuff like that. Um, puff only works with satin stitches. It does not work well with fill. You get a little bit of a raised look, but nothing that you would uh, uh, want to write home about, so to speak. So we say the rules kind of are at least uh, 20 points or 2 millimeter columns to 11 um, millimeter columns in order for the puff to work. So you're going to have a hard time on quarter inch letters and things like that puffing, but you can get up close to a half inch letter. Um, you can get some decent results. So uh, a huge rule is the puff portion of the logo is going to be the last to go down um, in the thread path. Um, several reasons for this. You stitch other things over the top. You can um, damage the foam some. Um, mainly though, if you think about the unevenness of the fabric when you put the foam down, it's hard to sew other stuff around it that's going to register. It's going to really distort things. Another huge rule is um, <clears throat> Uh, you should let people puff one color if they're connected, if they're separated throughout the design. It doesn't really matter how many colors are puffed. But in other words, you wouldn't let somebody puff a letter and the border that goes around it if it's a two-color letter. So I will show you this, <coughs> um, a sample of this. This is a design that we do at the shows. Um, it's a two-color right here. So the black is the puff color, of course. And so, uh, as you can see, the red is actually behind it, so we stitch um, first. <clears throat> Everything good still? Yeah. Um, one, one question was, uh, would puff work on a coarse fabric like a, like a duct or, or, pardon me, duck or um, canvas? And I can't come up with a reason that it wouldn't. Yeah, I've never tried something like that. But My, yeah, that should, the edges could be... Uh, a little stair-stepped because they would hit the, the weave um, <laughs> on, on an angle. But I, other won't. than that, I think you'd just be hitting the normal kind of embroidery issues with it. <clears throat> yeah, we, um, <clears throat> as I'll say in a second here, <clears throat> um, it's very common to use a size 80 needle for puff because, again, we rely on the needle penetration to perforate the foam for us, and um, that's gonna you're gonna need a thicker needle for something like duck right. or a really nasty canvas. So again, we haven't tried that, but I think that would be a, a pretty good uh, chance of success. So here for this um, Melco logo, this is one we do on hats. It shows. You can see that the red goes down first. That is the outline around the letters. But remember, we're only allowed to puff one color since they're touching, so we're going to do the letter itself. So the red is digitized first, and it is actually tucked under. Uh, Nate and I kind of came up with a word called underlapped. <laughs> we know what overlapped is. Well, underlap goes down underneath. You tuck it under the letter. This gives us a couple of advantages um, in even regular embroidery. If we do the border first, I can use a wider satin because it's tucked underneath the letter that isn't going to show as compared to doing the outline afterwards where I only have a certain width and I hope that everything lines up. So uh, critical in puff embroidery, it works to your advantage in regular embroidery also. All right, so uh, one color is the rule. Um, we have, uh, you can see what happens here if you haven't tried puff. Um, we have, uh, this is one from a uh, Long Beach trade show that we did. So you can see how we just peel off the foam after we're done um, and, uh, and clean up the crumbs, which I'll talk about here in a little bit. All right, another rule is we want to try and match the... Uh, foam to the thread color. Now manufacturers have 15, 20 different colors of foam at the most and of course there's hundreds of thread colors so you need to get close. 
Uh, reason for this is we're going to get a little bit of uh, the crumbs garbage, like we said, that's uh, residue from when we pulled off the foam. And you're less apt to see that if it's closer in color. Um, we're going to use a heat gun to shrink away those uh, crumbs too, but less density also is something that you can do if you have a closer uh, match to thread. The foam, uh, 15 colors, let's say, comes in uh, comes in different thicknesses, um, two, two to well, six millimeter. Three millimeter is the common in the industry, so that's where you should um, start. <coughs> Um, there are two different densities of uh, foam. R regular, which you could find at well, all over the place, craft stores, things like that. And uh, within the last year or so, there's been um, high density foam, which uh, gives you square letters. It perforates better, so I think it's a better choice. It really uh, wows the embroidery, so to speak. But I've held the same, uh, you know, hat design with high density and regular density foam up and, you know, ask people, give me your opinion. Some like the rounded better. So you'll have to try this. This whole presentation is going to try and give you all the different ideas and uses and ways people do it out there. Um, and you should try some experiment and pick the way that you like the best. Um, I'm not going to advocate, you know. It must be done this way because there you can get good results doing it several different ways. Okay, um, heat gun we talked about to tighten up the stitching. Also, sometimes you have to take a little screwdriver, scissors, or something and poke in the pieces that might hang out at the intersections because that's just a part of uh, puff foam embroidery. Can, can I throw in a quick caveat? Please. So, I, uh, I had a friend who was working on. Um, polyester hats and was doing foam and grabbed the the heat gun and was cleaning up the embroidery and then melted a big old hole in his polyester hat. <laughs> so keep in mind that the heat will affect the polyester of the thread, of the foam, and of the garment if you have that. So if you're using a heat gun, just be careful. Don't melt a big shiny spot in your garment. Just don't um, don't use just, the flamethrower to you know, set it. You just need to think about those kind of things. Yeah, that hat was uh, very funny. We've I've also <laughs> seen where people have uh, burned the melted the thread itself, right? The oh yeah, there was absolutely yeah, silver. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so keep it moving. Probably takes 15, 20 seconds or something to tighten up all the stitches um, and then move on. Um, okay, so the last rule is no dry cleaning, right? I mean, how many people dry clean their oh, baseball yeah. hat? But just letting you know, if you do, um, it will dissolve the foam. Now, I'm thinking there's some sort of a grunge application, right? <laughs> I mean, if you could dissolve the foam after you sew it, you might be able to sell it for double or triple, right? Uh, just kidding there. Okay, so um, we talked about the need to close the ends. Um, there are two different methods we use to close the ends uh, of the letters or shapes. Um, there's a capping method and a pinching method. So first I'm going to show you the capping method. All right, so I shall close this one. <clears throat> and I'm going to open a design that's called CT Puff. We sew this here um, at Melco in class. So here is a three color design. Uh, I could show you in 3D. Uh, so we're going to sew the white tucked under, under lap, then the black, and then we're going to sew the purple or the puff color last. All right, so we have how many open ends in this? One, two, three, four open ends in this design that we need to take care of. There's also some seams, so here's 90 degree seams right here, right here, over here, and over here also. So we're going to have to treat those um, to make sure that the, the uh, seam comes out looking good and you don't have uh, foam poking through there. All right, so <clears throat> um, that explains the kind of general process. How we deal with the capped ends is right here. I'll turn 3D off and zoom in. So you can see right here, um, this is the cap. Several things here. Um, there's different ways to do the caps. Um, I've seen successful results in 
the straight uh, column method, I could, I guess you could say, where this is just a satin stitch going across. There's another method that's pretty effective that actually turns around and uh, sews sort of three sides of a satin stitch, and I'm going to show you that when we digitize the letter E here in a second. Um, <clears throat> we don't want a, a huge high density um, for the caps. Um, for the letter itself, we're going to use something very high. It's about twice what normal embroidery is, so somewhere around 1.7. Um, depends on the thickness of the foam, the garment, all sorts of stuff there, but in a range between um, 1.5 to 2, I like about 1.7, 1.6 for 3 millimeter foam. However, the <coughs> excuse me, the caps are going to be lighter. Here you can see we use 2.5 density. Um, the point is here, we want this to cut the foam at the top here, because this is the open end, but we don't want to cut the foam on the other end of the cap. So here you can see uh, we used a feature called Random Edge, which scrambles the needle penetrations, because you know if they line up, we could cut the foam before uh, the outside edge, and of course we don't want that. So how do we set that up? Here's the properties in Design Shop. You can see we have two and a half density. Um, <coughs> If I go to the Effects tab here, I have Random Edge. So I've enabled it. I set it to oh, 20, 25%. That's sort of how radical the scrambled stitches are. And then right or left side, depending on how you um, digitized it. OK, so that's caps um, for one version. Now I'm going to digitize the letter E, so I'll be able to show you kind of the other uh, curved three-sided cap that I was just talking about. So I will get rid of this one here. I will call up a vector, which is a letter E, just to give us. This kind of shows some basic examples. Um, we have three open ends, and we have one 90 degree seam right here that we have to take care of. All right, let me make sure that I didn't miss anything. <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> okay, so let's start. So what I do first is we're going to set our properties. So I will right click on the walk stitch tool. Stitch length, uh, some people go very tight, somewhere around 17 points. Uh, 20 would work. 25 is not a bad choice. Um, so we'll, I'll just leave this at 20. We'll go to the tie, uh, tie in tie off tab. We'll check that. We'll check the tie offs. Um, Sometimes a style 5, which is a plus sign of a really secure tie-in, um, is a choice that I like to make sure that the thread is secured because you're going all the way through the foam and the fabric and that can, um, that can be a lot. So uh, style 5 is what I choose. Um, default, um, you could jack the number up to 4 if you're having trouble with the success of the tie-ins to make sure that you have ample before it starts actually walking. For the tie-off, uh, this is uh, debatable also. Um, style 1 is in a straight line. That's the one that I like. Um, I do like to move the end uh, where the tie-off happens off the end of the letter um, because you don't have the cap there and the top stitching and so much to drill through to try and secure the stitching. So we're going to move that off. I'll show you that in a bit. Um, width sometimes might be better at around seven or eight points, and the number of stitches uh, you can try three. Too many stitches will tend to hurt the foam where the lock stitches are, so usually um, three or four works pretty good. And you're making these changes mostly because you're doing this on foam? Um, yes, exactly. Okay. And I'm doing this ahead of time, like usually it's a good idea to set all your properties before you start digitizing, then you don't have to edit them all in. If you set them up, they carry the properties as you go along until you change them. It just It's a time saver. Okay, and then I can go to my uh, drop down and pull satin stitches. Um, <clears throat> there's a couple considerations right here. First of all, uh, the density 2017, whatever you pick for the top stitching there, and it's also going to be lighter for the caps, around 2.5. Um, but this is very important here. The fill stitch is like, uh, some people know it like auto split. Um, 
<clears throat> where it generates random stitch penetrations across the satin stitch when it becomes wider than, in our case, we default it to six millimeters. Um, too wide of a satin, normal embroidery can um, snag. And so if we turn this off, we're going to make sure we don't get any of those split stitches. We just get a full satin stitch, nice wide, which is what we want for puff. Okay, so I set that all up. Now my properties are set up. You can grab the walk stitch tool. Also, if you notice here, um, <clears throat> that, uh, wow, is it that much of a lag? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Sorry, how slowed. No, no, you're fine. <laughs> okay, so uh, if you could see, I'm a strong advocate of the full screen cursor. Um, when you digitize uh, 90 degree shapes, not exactly uh, script, but some block and stuff like that, man, it can help you line up stuff um, on the fly instead of have to go back and edit it all in. Okay, so I've got the walk stitch tool. Now we're going to tie in somewhere inside of the uh, foam. Uh, some people like a center run um, walk stitch to uh, kind of s attach the foam loosely to the fabric so we're not getting too much movement when we're doing the top stitching. Some people like an edge walk. Um, kind of need to play around with both and see which one you like the best. So uh, first of all, I'll start here and I hold Alt and don't forget it constrains so I get a nice straight um, uh, walk stitch that's not going to drift left or right. You can just stabilize this first of all, like we said before, to get it to set. And uh, now we're going to do the cap. So I'll hit Enter to finish that element. And I will zoom in to show you. Um, we already saw the other random edge cap, which is just a straight 90 degree. Um, satin stitch. Here's a different one here that works. Can you, can you change that color from blue to like a sure. bright color so we can see it a little bit better? Light green? That'll work. How? Better? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to grab the column uh, one tool. That works really pretty good. And if I can catch this on three sides and let it stick out a millimeter is what we said, I'm going to get the best uh, results or good results. So I will start here and I will digitize straight. And <clears throat> you can use curves on the inside and straights on the outside and then it will generate short stitches um, which is going to keep the foam Sorry, that should be a straight from uh, cutting. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? That's pretty clever. I like that. Yep. Um, actually, uh, you can learn a ton through just viewing different videos on the web. And Melco's uh, Canadian distributor, um, Extreme Wizards, is where I saw this uh, demoed on the web works pretty good. All right, so we'll straighten this out. And then I have a choice to use uh, short stitches or um, if this is too wide, it's not gonna generate the short stitches. Helps if the sides taper in just a little bit, just so this isn't gonna hang out. Also, I can measure with a ruler and here I'm about 20 points. So I'm gonna move this in um, 10 points. A millimeter or so out the edge works pretty good. This could be a little bit good. Here again, this could be something that we have a feature um, called the custom uh, shapes, which is located here, allows you to store your, your favorite shapes. And uh, I, I could choose that also. And then I wouldn't need to digitize this time after time. I'm going to be really mean. <clears throat> do you get the caps right on the first time, or do you have to edit them after you're so outside? I always have to edit them. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I have been digitizing a long time and it's just, you know, I've never really found more than a handful of digitizings that I didn't have to edit after I sew. <laughs> Me either. Uh, it doesn't uh, look that way on the fabric as it does on the screen all of a sudden. Just kind of like we talked about with the small lettering and having letters be different heights. Okay, so for this one here, let's pull up the properties and see that we have short stitches off. I will apply that to on and now we get some randomness here. Yes. Can everybody see that? Uh, cool. Wait, wait, wait. Take the, Can just merge. Yeah, merge the colors. 
Okay, and that's all checked. That's really cool. So that's um, that's going to be pretty good. Now um, I'm going to. I did a cap here. I'm going to cap the center and also the top leg here. So I'll go back and grab my walk stitch tool. Don't forget we have accelerator keys that will allow you to put keyboard shortcuts for all of your digitizing tools. That is truly the way to get the speed out of the system. Okay, so hold Alt to constrain. I'm going up here. Now I could go through the pain of digitizing that again, but I'm, gonna, I'm lazy, so I use Control D is duplicate, hold Alt. Well, in this case, this is going to be in, so I wouldn't need to. I can shorten this up. I'll zoom in so you can see. And this is about hey, one millimeter, so we're good. So there's my second cap, but it's in the wrong order. So I'm going to go to the, uh, the project view, and I'm going to resequence it and move that last. So it sews the cap down at the bottom, walks up here, sews the cap here. I'm going to go back to the walk stitch tool, and as I come across, I'm just going to deal with this 90 degree seam here um, while I'm here to show you. So several ways to do this. Some people choose to just make a light uh, set of running stitches just across to help keep this sort of down, but you don't want to sever the foam. Um, Another way to do it, I'll just delete these, is to digitize a column. So I could go to my column one tool and I can digitize just a straight column. Again, 2.5 density for this one. And I'm going to go with the random edge. So I'll pull up the properties, bring the window over so you can have a look. Remember, this is under effects. Click it. I have both. And, oh, I don't know, like I said, 20, 25% seems to work pretty good. <clears throat> All right. Yeah. So this is going to secure this 90 degrees, but it's not going to sever the foam on either sides. All right. So back to the walk stitch tool. I'll come up here. And one last cap. So I'm going to, again, copy the one from the bottom. I can go control D as duplicate. Slide this up. I'm using Alt so it doesn't drift left or right. And then I need to resequence, so I'm going to move it down the list. So it does the center, walks up to the top, does the top cap. Okay. Now we're going to start the um, final top stitching. So you kind of got to think about where you're going to exit this. In this case, I'm going to exit in the middle leg. So I will start right where I am. Uh, different tools you can use. You could use a complex fill tool, a unifill that has multiple stitch direction lines. You could use a column two, which is a really good choice. We're using on a lot of our alphabets lately. Uh, nice, smooth, even, uh, uninterrupted stitching. Or you could go with the old workhorse, which is column one we've been <laughs> using since, so, 85. <laughs> All right, so column one, uh, I'm going to just lower the density to one, uh, 1 1.7 points or 0.17 millimeters, however you want to read it. We'll zoom in, and I'm going to start right on the edge of the letter. So straight, I'm going to use my alt to constrain. Um, I like to have it turn uh, as it gets closer to the end and stay a little more parallel rather than just let it start mitering all the way from the beginning of the column. So I will do this. I'm going to come over just a little bit. I'll click there. I'll catch my corner. If you were using column two, you could do the same thing with your stitch directions after you're done. Um, so if you guys are using that, no stress. Yes. Uh, column two is a very, very good tool. Everything is, is good in its own for its own tool, right? Okay, and then we'll finish up here and hit enter. Okay, so now I have part of it done. I can hit escape, and uh, the last element will be selected. I can move my exit point here. I like to go about right in the middle. So that will tell it to sew from here down to here, walk, and sew back up to meet it. Sometimes 
where these meet, you'll still have a gap because you're pushing the foam from both directions and sometimes it'll stay in the middle. So um, a good uh, feature for that is to um, automatically uh, add stitches to the overlap. So I can right click, go to properties, I'll drag the properties window for you to see again. And we will go into the uh, advanced tab and we have fill overlines. So I can um, set this up for oh, two, three, or four, whatever you find you need, overlap lines. And um, where they meet now, it's probably hard for you to see on the screen, but there is four or five overlap stitches here where it meets, and that's going to take care of the um, issue. All right, back to the column tool. I like to overlap, so I'm going to push this back a little bit to account for the shrinkage and go with straights and on my line. Boom. Okay, problem is the lock stitches are going to happen at the end and there's a lot of thread going on with the cap and the full density of the satin stitch, so I'm going to select it and I will move this back so that it will sew out, walk out, and sew back and put the lock stitch right here where there is less stitch or less uh, uh, foam and thread and everything to go through. All right. Don't forget when you're done to center your design, which is up here, and uh, save it out and um, this would look good to sew. We turned off the, the uh, fill if greater than, so you can see that we have nice um, even stitching, satin stitches all over, all three ends are capped, and the seam is taken care of uh, where they intersection at 90 degrees. Okay, see if I want to explain anything else. Uh, another alternative for this seam right here, if I was going to change things up where let's say I'm going to sew this <clears throat> and then I'm going to sew this, I can have some issues right here at this seam. So we took care of it with a satin stitch with random edges. Um, another option if I was going to stitch this first is to change the angle. So I can tuck this like this. I could say move it over. So now where the two intersect, it's not a 90 degree uh, intersection. This is going to be a forward um, compared to the, the bottom and so it's not going to be as noticeable. Um, another, uh, let me see, I'll just undo that. Another uh, way to treat this right here is to use um, what I call a sealer stitch. This is good for all regular embroidery. You're always going to have trouble where things intersect at 90 degrees. And so <clears throat> if I am going to, I'll just switch this for demo purposes real quick. If I'm going to sew uh, this first and then I'm going to follow up and probably end down here, <coughs> In order to take care of this problem, I would do this in two um, column one segments. So I will delete the bottom. So now uh, I've sewn this, I've walked up, sewn down to here, and I will use the manual stitch, which is located in the walk stitch uh, toolbar. And so the last one is manual stitch. This only drops the needle where you click. So I'm about right here. I could click here. I will click over. So here I've pulled a gap because um, I've sewn over a 90 degree intersection, but then I've closed that gap by putting a few more stitches back and forth right over the seam. Hit enter. That's taken care of. Go back to the column tool and I can digitize the rest of the shape. This is a very good way to hide 90 degree intersections. Um, that CT Puff design has it um, at all the 90 degree intersections. Boom, highlight it. Don't forget, move this off the end. And the tie off will happen right there. OK, so that is capping. Um, the second method I'll show you now is called pinching. So let me close this down. Any questions so far? No. Confused yeah. everybody yeah. pretty well? Yeah, I mean, that's how we do it. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, another way to do it is pinching, and I have a sample right here. 
Um, <clears throat> turn on the stitching. I can turn off the border so it's not so confusing. Okay, so here we can see that rather than have a 90 degree uh, end, where you're going to have an open end right here, you'd have to put a cap in. Sometimes on different shapes, um, you make up your mind on this after doing some, some trials, but thicker 90 degree, like fat block letters like I just showed you, I tend to, to um, find that those cap better. The tapered, pointed, uh, angled, um, script, all that kind of stuff, if you're trying to puff those shapes, a lot of times you can pinch the end and uh, and get really really good results. So for pinching all we have to do is turn the direction of the stitching. Normally uh, if this was just regular embroidery I'm gonna have a satin stitch that's gonna you know be uh, uh, vertical up and down. If, As you can see in this one the stitches are at an angle. We just turn them oh, 45 or whatever uh, works for you to close the end. Now I have stitch penetrations along this whole side, I have them along the end and along the top, so I'm going to cut the foam all the way around here. Why can't we just use pinches all the time? Pinching can give you some distortion when it comes to really thick shapes um, because of the high density that we use. So I just find it better um, uh, to pinch thinner areas like uh that. I tend to, and I'll try to come back in so y'all can not have a disembodied voice. Um, I, when I'm using pinching uh, to do this for foam, I typically would do it for more organic shapes. So again, like Scott mentioned, think scripts, think black letter, like um, I just lost it, Old English um, style lettering, something like that. Things that would hide the distortion. You've heard me say it before. Um, embroidery for me is not about being perfect. It's about hiding the fact that I'm not. Um, so for stuff like that, I'm going to use, again, those more organic shapes, um, curvilinear pieces where, where it will taper and, and shift along the form. Um, and it works really, really well for that. It does. Um, yeah, Old English is a good one. I totally lost the name of it, but yeah. Old English and there's an uh, so as soon as we say <laughs> you can't just take the alphabet text throw the foam in <laughs> add the density and expect it to work Listening there Bob. in V10 uh, design shop there are two fonts the one is Old English like we mentioned and the second is uh, Rounded Sands and those two fonts um, you can pretty much do what we say you can't do. <laughs> and so we'll get to that in just one second. So finish up with um, pinches. So you can see how the stitches are turned at 90 degrees. I mean another thing I did to this logo when I made it was, uh, and 3D is going to show you this, I put a thin border around the outside in the same color. Sometimes that can crispen up that edge. So um, have a look at nice. that in your choices. All right. So um, I want to show you what this looks like uh, when it comes off the machine finished. And so we have, darn it. So the old JPEG viewer needs to be retired, I guess, but. Not right now. <laughs> <laughs> this right. is live. Right. I think I did this last time too. I'll work on replacing our next time. Okay, so here Facebook. And all right. So this is a kind of a cool view <laughs> of uh, pinching. So here you can see how the ends of the letters are treated. Rather than a long stitch going all the way across, um, you can see how the stitches are turned and it secures the edges um, all the way around. It's a good shot of a couple of um, joints too, where, where pieces are coming in together. Yeah, I know. Yeah, you can see the 90 degree intersections and all that. Um, <clears throat> Okay, and here's another one that I did. Um, 
uh, the word community. So this is actually digitized, but um, we have a, a old English alphabet um, in Design Shop, which you could try here. The kind of the reason that this font works is because the nature of the shape of the letters sort of pinches itself. Every letter ends up in a triangular point uh, at the bottom, or you can see the C over there. It just sort of works. So uh, try your old English and see. It's a good starting point. Um, the other one is rounded sands. Rounded sands is like a block alphabet with rounded tops. So it's pinching as it's sewing from uh, a little point to the full width of the satin stitch. And if it doesn't work exactly after a sew out, convert it to wireframe and edit it a little bit. You've got, I mean, if you're 80 or 90 percent of the way there, that's still saving you a lot of work. Exactly. Um, uh, so pinching is uh, kind of a no-brainer because um, <clears throat> it, it's so easy to do. Uh, what we find is usually, depending on the design, is you might end up merging the two. You might use in the same logo some pinches and some caps. I'm sorry, you're getting software recommendations from Jeff, and it's really funny and cracking me up. <laughs> oh. Uh, on JPEG viewers? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. Uh, he's this thing forever. <laughs> I need to get a new one. I got it. I got it, Jeff. <laughs> okay. So um, another alternative that I'd just like to throw out there, which um, some people like, is uh, the, there's a different way by stitching the, the, the puff satin stitches twice at sort of a half density. Um you can get uh, a different result also. So here is an R, so it has the drop shadow, or the outline I should say, which you can see is tucked under like we talked about. And then for the uh, top stitching here, rather than just go at one pass at it, uh, the digitizer goes twice. So you can see first starts here, sews around to it, and this is a 3-0 density, maybe could be a little bit lighter and then right away turns around and sews the same shape back. So once going uh, out and once going back at another 3-0. Um, there's a spot in here which is kind of interesting here. This changes the stitch directions. So we have one going this way and the other going the other. So first one this direction, second one, the other. So you get slightly different <coughs> coverage. <clears throat> you would get different coverage, yeah, and it's something you, you could experiment and uh, see which one you like better. Um, it's an interesting concept. I mean, this still has the, uh, you know, the seams, the, the mm -hmm. satins that go underneath the final top stitching. Um, you can see here that we mixed, you know, uh, here's some pinching right here. There's some satins for um, the 90 degree intersections here. Again, sometimes you find you're going to switch and use some caps and pinching all in the same design depending on the different shapes. Okay, so um, that's a different concept. Try that sometime. Um, the easiest to do is um, closed end shapes. So here is uh, probably hard to see, you know, over the internet on picture form, but the part of this design that's puffed is the black outer border. And, uh, you know, I mean, the, the hassle with digitizing for puff is dealing with the ends. Whether we cap them or pinch them, they take extra work. Here, since it's a fully closed shape, you really have no ends to deal with, and it is very simple to digitize. So for this one, we stitched the fills for the mountains, the, the angled lines and all that stuff, and the letters first, then we put down the foam, and uh, column one is what I used for this, but sometimes on easier shapes and stuff, you can get by with single line column tool. So go around it in, with one line, pick a certain width. Density can be a little bit less because we're not talking about a very wide letter here. This is so uh, 30 points, 40 points, I think, 3, 4 millimeters. And so the density was about 3 and looks really good. Funny because we have all these, uh, these caps in, in the classroom with all these different samples and stuff of puff and people gravitate to this one um, a lot. So that shows how impressed they are with it. 
So, um, <clears throat> digitizing this, like I say, is very simple. The, the single line column tool to make a closed shape or um, column one or a combo of the two, depending on the shape. So, um, have a look at that. That could be added to a lot of cool stuff. You could do a lot of fills or all sorts of patterns and stuff on the inside and border it with the, the foam um, for a pretty unique look. Okay, so breaking the rules is the last section. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, I want to show you this. So, <clears throat> let this catch up. <clears throat> You're good. So, uh, metallic puff. I mean, have you ever seen that? How wild is this? Um, sews on a reasonable hat. You can see this is a five panel hat. Um, it's not a coarse, um, you know, flat brim kind of uh, hat that's so popular today. Um, so it's without a thread break though, and pretty impressive. So what size needle did you use? I used a eighty twelve sharp point. That's nice. the most common yeah, needle for this. Um, and I slowed the machine down. I think I was uh, about eight fifty nine hundred something Fair like that. Um, but this also shows a concept too. This was done a long time ago. We we're all getting used to puff and all this stuff. So this was done where the caps were not pushed out a millimeter past the edge of the column. And as you can see, if you look at the open ends, can you see that pretty good? Yeah, you're good. Um, you can see that the thread falls off the end. It's not good, crisp, and straight. Um, it, it's mushed over. So pulling the cap out past the end um, is going to give you a nice, crisp result. So it's always good to, to look at some errors to see um, how to do it. Okay, so that's metallic. Um, here's another wild one, too. People love this in class, too. So right here, this is the stock pattern fills that come in Design Shop. Um, you can make your own. Very simple to do, but we are going to, you know, populate it with uh, whatever, 30 or something like that to give you some um, ammo to start. So I can pick a pattern fill when it comes to puff embroidery to, to really spice it up um, even another level. So now that we've seen the pattern fills to it, I will show you a design that we did with it. And everybody see that? That's cool. So this is just a satin stitch, but we, I used uh, Waves, I think was the name of the pattern. So again, we did the border first, so we could underlap it, get good width, good stability. Then we put the, uh, the darker blue puff on top of it with the, the pattern um, fill. So, uh, wild concept. Haven't seen this out there too much. Let did me you just... offset your outline for that, or was that straight? Uh, no, straight. Nice. Yeah. So, um, I will just run it real quick so I can show you a little bit about the properties. So here it is. This is his brother in red. <laughs> okay, so just by highlighting this right here, you can see, um, let me bring up object properties over here, that if we just pick a satin. We used a higher density, turn short stitches off, and also don't forget disable the, the fill if greater than so we don't get any split lines in it. And down here at the bottom, we have the pattern fill section. And so here was all the ones that you just saw on the picture of the sew out of the light blue squares. And ocean is what I picked. I thought it was called waves, but uh, ocean. And so uh, be a little bit careful. If you're going to use the pattern fills, you want a larger pattern that's pretty simple. I mean, you don't want to be just beating the fabric to, to death with some, you know, double... Uh, ring pattern or something like that that's going to keep the stitches tight. So uh, very simple. Pick the pattern fill, make sure you've got satin, increase the density, and um, give her a shot. I mean, that's a, a pretty neat concept right there. Um, and then, of course, there is always exceptions to the rule, so I'll show you one more right here. Uh, we know this logo from the college in Florida. Um, this, uh, the concept here is we say puff is last. There is, of course, you have to break rules sometimes just by the, the way the artwork kind of lays out. Um, 
but here you can see the light blue, like around his eye, um, the, 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 at the top of the bottom jaw and that kind of stuff, the nostrils. Those are very small shapes, and it would be really, really hard to stitch those first and then stitch the puff and try and keep it open and crisp around the edges. So very few stitches. I broke the rules and stitched the blue after, so um, it just shows you you got to do whatever it takes to, to get things to come out. It, it definitely gave it a different sculptural effect, though. It did, yeah. It's that, That's an awesome can you, um, design. Yep. Can you bring up... And you're actually right on the right screen. Um, oh. Would you show where to get the pattern fills, um, both from help yep. me the okay. property bar and from sure. properties? So here, um, I, I have uh, the quick change toolbar, and so I set my density here. I pick satin here. If I look over here and I mouse over, it will just stop and it'll say select stored pattern. Here is where all the, the patterns that I showed you are, and we picked uh, Ocean for this one, which has got a checkbox right here. The two are connected. The other way to do it is to right-click, go into Properties. Here's the same satin, the same density, and your pattern fill is down here. So here is where you can select them. You also can see them if you click on the three-dot box here. It will show you... Um, 3D renderings yep. of all the stitches. Perfect. All right, you. sound good. All right. Um, I mean, there's another concept uh, stuff that we've done, which is double puff, where you've done a layer of puff and then stop the machine and then put another layer of puff over that. Uh, that becomes pretty tall. I mean, needles are only so long, and you're drilling through a whole hat plus two layers of three millimeter foam <laughs> is pretty much. Came out, it looks good, but you have a hard time keeping this top layer crisp because you're already over um, one layer of foam instead of just on the fabric. Okay, so we're going to keep answering questions after this is over. If you have any more, uh, feel free to type them in and we'll uh, answer them. And uh, hopefully this helps you um, work on puff, get better results edit some other designs, create your own. It's a very popular topic today, and um, hopefully this helps you uh, have success in it. Take care, and we will see you soon.